have you ever seen those uh, shark shows where it's all very exciting, but you, you don't learn a thing about sh actual sharks? In fact, the whole thing seems to have nothing at all to do with uh, reality. This show is gonna be totally different, like nothing you've ever seen. Come on! He can actually stick his jaws out like that. So he can control his jaws separately from his head. We are just now figuring out what the oldest vertebrate on Earth is. We talk about this mindless killing machine with the black eyes. They actually don't have black eyes. <laughs> they have these beautiful <laughs> indigo blue eyes. These are not crazy, indiscriminate man eaters. These great white sharks are really smart. Now, did you see that huge bit of us on the caudal peduncle? And he loves low frequency sounds. So, 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 so. We learned that not only does he have the compass, but he has the map. There's so much unknown about him that it just blows my mind. I'm Franklin Raff, and I'm about to take you diving with the great white shark. I'm a professor de biología. I teach biology in Mexico City. I'm also a rescue diver and an ocean sailor. I've sailed pretty much all over the world. And pretty much all over the world is great white shark habitat, with the exception, perhaps, of Antarctica, although we are not quite sure. And there's so much we don't know about this animal that is threatened. If you came from outer space and wanted to make a documentary film about humanity, and your film consisted entirely of close-up shots of us eating, you too could make a movie called Jaws. But there's so much more to the human condition. We signal, we laugh, we play, we have families. And this animal, the great white shark, science indicates has been on Earth 500 million years. And through two major mass extinctions, He's thrived, this animal that I learned in biology class was a primitive vertebrate, as opposed to us. So this is our time. I'm going to take you down with me, literally, at Isla Guadalupe in Mexico to dive with the Tiburón Blanco, the great white shark, and you will not believe the things that you're about to learn. San Diego, California, our launch point for the expedition. There are lots of places to see the great white shark. Neptune Islands, in Australia, and in South Africa. But what makes Guadalupe Island so fantastic is the clarity of the water. And that's why we're bound south-southwest to Isla Guadalupe in search of the great white shark. The journey takes us across the open Pacific. On our way, let's do some studying. We're gonna put our noses in the books and figure out a little more about the animals we hope to see. I want to introduce you to my friend here. His name is Fluffy. First, I want to tell you about his caudal fin, because you'll notice in this symmetrical shape, the same shape that we see on all the very fastest fish of the sea, the mako, the tuna. There's no room for hydrodynamic shedazzle over here. No turbulence in this man's life. Let's turn him this way. You can see in the caudal peduncle the massive musculature of this particular slingshot which makes this fish able to reach speeds of 20, 25, possibly 30 knots. We're not quite sure. His skin, a little bit different from that of a bony fish. These are not normal scales. These are a very particular kind of dermal denticle, little teeth that comprise the skin of the fastest fish around. What is the secret of the speed of dermal denticles? Well, we don't actually know. The navies of the world and those companies that make the fast swimming suits, they're still trying to unlock the secrets of the speed of shark skin. Let's turn him up here. Now look, can you see he looks kind of like a rocket ship? He is a rocket ship. Werner von Braun, put down the calculator. V1 is right here. And in his fins, for instance, in his beautiful pectoral fins, you can see that they're wing-shaped. This fish does not have an air bladder that regulates his buoyancy at sea. He just has a liver filled with oil, which of course is lighter than water, and these keep him 
flying with a little bit of lift, just like wings. Look at his water handling system too. These magnificent five huge gill slits and the bocal area enabling him even at very low speeds to move oxygenated water through his body so that oxygen is transferred quickly to all of the important parts. And looking at this beautiful mouth, you can see that his jaws are protrusive, not stuck to his skull like ours are. He can actually stick his jaws out like that and get the prey he needs and then saw it up a little bit. His jaws are connected to his skull only by a piece of cartilage so he can control his jaws separately from his head. This is the Messerschmitt BF-109E of the seas, the Raptor F-22. This is a fast attack killing machine. We've anchored at the northeast side of the island. It's inside a little protected hook, kind of a cove. This is a perfect place to be protected from the elements and also, hopefully, see the great white. We're finally here at Isla Guadalupe. It took us about just under a day to get here at just over 10 knots. It's time to suit up. Final safety preparations are made. We do not want a loss of control in any underwater environment, especially when we're surrounded by deadly predators. And the moment approaches as our custom cages drop beneath the waves. This is the moment of truth. These are the chilly waters of the North Pacific Drift continually upwelling and coming south from Alaska, sort of curving around. I'm really happy I have a thicker neoprene suit today. And even after a lifetime of diving, this moment of immersion is still a delightfully crazy and unnatural experience. The setup of the equipment is really involved. We got breathing systems, safety equipment, audio, camera feeds, it takes a little while to get it all ready to go, but we're on the job. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you both really good. Now, you switched over to 24 frames per second. We are at 24 frames and we are rolling, so. Okay, audio is rolling. Franklin, uh, the camera's yours. I'm speaking to you right now from a shark cage off Guadalupe Island, off Mexico. Look at these beautiful blackwood jacks hanging around. They want to see what's going to happen. They're probably here for the show. All of the cameras are rolling. All of the systems are running. Are we going to see the Great White? And then... Look, 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 look! I'll go check him out! Oh, check him out! Wow! Awesome. This is why people come from all over the world, not to fear the great white shark, but to experience the majesty of this creature. It's totally cool. When you're face to face with a great white, it's, it's actually very emotional. I mean, it's amazing. 
it's one thing to read in a magazine and a book and you see it and you know the biology and it's another thing when you're a foot away from 500 million years of perfection. But I've got to learn about the Great White's ethology, the way he behaves, the things he does, the communicating, the gestures. So I got to start with the guy who just watches them for a living every day. One of the nicest guys you'll ever meet, Captain Salmon. I'm astern yesterday, and I'm, I'm watching your crew members, mm -hmm. and they're saying, oh, there's Dottie. Oh, there's uh, Polly. <laughs> Uh, tell me a little bit about that, because this, this is like family for you, these guys. It is. They're almost like our, our pets swimming around the boat. We can recognize them. Size, sex. Uh, a lot of them have different different uh, blotching patterns on them. Some of them have white scars on their tails, on their nose. But when you're actually a few feet away from a great white, you could see, oh, you know, she's mottled in this way, or she's mm -hmm. been damaged, or she must have had a really difficult mating routine with somebody a few <laughs> months ago. <laughs> You really know some of these sharks. Even their behaviors. Right. Sometimes, for instance, when birds sing, mm -hmm. sometimes animals do things just for fun. Oh, yeah. Just for fun. Yep. And there's no science behind it, no reasoning. <laughs> it's not fight or flight. It's not stimulus response. It's not foraging. Yep. He's just jumping out of the water because he's saying hi. Yep. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> and they do that. And it's amazing that we see it all the time down here. And it's. Mm -hmm. It's incredible to just watch their personalities and how they react with each other, with the cages, with the baits, with the boat. You never know. And as a teacher, this fits my philosophy and the great white shark perfectly. Sometimes the most educated answer is, I do not know. On board with us, some of the brightest lights in the world of shark research. I'm with Maurits von Senek Bergman from Florida International University and the Bimini Shark Lab. Uh, in the Bahamas. Telemetry, tele to send, metry information. A big part of what we know about the Great White is from careful tracking mechanisms and you're on the cutting edge of that. So by attaching these transmitters to animals, we get a sense of where the animal's going, when mm -hmm. and why. Mm -hmm. Different receivers are placed in different habitats and so by being able to reconstruct movement patterns over time and overlaying that with habitat map, we can get an idea of why these habitats are so important to these animals. And it's an acoustic transmitter because radio waves do not propagate well underwater. Correct. Tagging is critical to understanding great white shark habitat and movement. Wanted to introduce you to some of my pals at Cal State Long Beach's famous shark lab. This is the locus for great white shark research. This is an example of an acoustic tag. So this can actually be uh, pinned into basically just the outside skin of the shark. They have really thick skin, so it doesn't do too much harm. A tag about this size will typically last about one to two years. And so the idea is that it'll actually transmit an acoustic ping, so an actual like sound that travels really well through water. Uh, and then what we have is an acoustic receiver. So this listens for those pings. So anytime you're within usually typically about 400, 500 meters from something like this, um, this will record um, all the detections and like pings that it hears from those specific tags. Each tag has a specific sound or um, code basically, yes, yeah. for um, an individual shark, right? Mm -hmm. So what we do is we'll go find these receivers uh, underwater. We usually have them on like moorings that are underwater, like sand screws, things like that. We'll download the information. We'll know all the sharks that were in that area um, over whatever given time that the receiver's been in the water. Do you ever lose these? Can Unfortunately, lose time to time, yes. One reason or another, like heavy wave actions, bad weather, we do lose $15,000 piece of hardware. Speaking of lost receivers, the human factor always comes into play in scientific research. The first acoustic receiver we had was eaten by a shark the moment we dropped it in. So naturally, we wanted to protect the second one from the shark, so we put it near the screw of the boat, the propeller, and you're about to see it for the last time because um, we ran over it. There goes vacation money. But back to the lab. So these are actually um, satellite tags. Um, so this one specifically is a PAT tag or pop off archival tag. And so what this allows us to do is whenever this is at the surface, it actually transmits radio waves, which will go to satellites. Um, and then they'd be able to tell us almost real time where those sharks are located. 
Uh, but one of the drawbacks is something like a marine mammal. This is super helpful because they have to come to the surface to breathe. So anytime that happens, this is going to be able to talk to a satellite. Now with something like a shark, where they can go you know, days, weeks at a time without coming to the surface because oh, yeah. uh, they don't need to come to the surface to breathe. But we can't have acoustic receivers everywhere, right? So there was a time where they thought white sharks were typically like a coastal species. Turns out at least the ones we have here, like off the western coast of the United States and uh, Mexico, yeah. they'll actually go all the way out to the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And we don't have any acoustic receivers to listen for those, like any transmitters that we have on the sharks. So this helps us find out that the sharks are actually traveling out to the middle of the Pacific Ocean, what's called the Shared Offshore Foraging Area, or the SOFA. They also call it the Shark Cafe. It's actually programmed after a certain amount of time to basically just detach from the animal and pop up to the surface, and then it'll download through those radio waves to the satellites all the information. So latitude, longitude of where the shark's been at the surface, as well as like the depth and temperature of like kind of so you can get like dive profiles and get temperatures associated with that as well. That's excellent. Radioactive markers and tracers are a big part of dating abiological and biological materials, including the great white. How old do they get? And how do we know how old a shark is? I'm not gonna ask her. <laughs> so white sharks we know can live as, at this point, as far as we know, to 70 years old due to looking at the uh, radioactive signature in their vertebrae. So when sharks age, they lay down rings in their vertebrae like a tree lays down rings. And using this radioactive signature, which was from the nuclear bombs going off during the 1940s, we can determine and estimate how old that these species actually are. Now, I saw a news story just the other day, and I was thinking of you because it was about how old sharks can be, yes. and the discussion was about the Greenland shark, yes. and uh, I am fascinated by this animal, and I can see why you are. The oldest living Greenland shark that we found lived between either 272 years old up to 500 years. So 272 is the minimum, but the expected was around 300 to 400 years. Isn't it amazing to you, it certainly is to me, that we are just now figuring out what the oldest vertebrate on Earth is. This is the front line of marine biology. Ura! The cutting edge right now in science is uh, developing uh, animal-born cameras to get a first-person view of what the animal sees and so therefore what the animal is doing at any given time and moment as long as the camera is running. So it offers way more context than just uh, telemetry by itself. Like we've got a wild animal, how do we get the information back? We don't train them to come home. Correct. So what happens is uh, these cameras, we uh, clip them to the dorsal fin mm -hmm. and we have uh, specialized mechanisms that hold the camera in place uh, on the dorsal fin. Mm -hmm. So this is what we call uh, galvanic release. So it's mm -hmm. a piece of metal alloy that actually breaks down in seawater over time. As soon as the galvanic release uh, corrodes, the camera tag pops off to the surface and that's when a radio signal is transmitted to the satellite and then communicate it through uh, your computer to the scientist and thereby you know, we know where the, that anim where the camera is at that particular time. Do we pick up the camera or does the camera <laughs> upload all of the photographic images we to us? We pick up the camera. So the camera will only uh, transmit its location and then it's up to us to find it and retrieve the data. So without physically recovering the tag, we will not be able to see what the animal's been doing uh, for the duration of the camera tag deployment. Is it working? Yes. What have we learned from these? Um, so far we have learned on sharks that sharks can be social, that sharks can be uh, dominant and subordinate. So you get to see a glimpse in the hierarchy of a particular species. So that's like social interactions. And we also can infer uh, predation attempts and predation success. So not every uh, attack is actually also a success. So with camera tags, we can actually get an idea of how successful an animal is in hunting. On board with us, Lalo Sadi. He has been working with great whites for decades all over the world. We miss a lot in South Africa, pretty much because of the murky waters. You don't get to see the same kind of behavior, body language underwater. 
here with the clean blue water, you get to observe everything. And that is what is fascinating to me. Every time I'm in the cage, I'm looking down, I'm watching how they communicate with one another. Um, again, the gaping as we're talking about, it's usually about dominance with the white sharks. The more dominant the shark is, um, he's gonna chase the other ones away. So you do see that behavior. Um, so you see the gape where they open their mouths up wide and they flare their gills and that's making themselves look bigger than they are. It's a threat display to the other sharks below them. Here as well you can see the arch in the pectorals drop into the back. You have this whole communication dance that is happening between the white sharks that you Again, in 14 years in South Africa, I never saw it, pretty much because the water is murkier. So just like a dog usually will drop his ears back to adopt a threatening pose, a shark will bring his pectoral fins in to yeah. show. And more, more of a drop down and the arch of the back. And that is usually a threat display to another shark. And yes. you've seen that. Yeah, here we get to observe it quite a bit. When you have two or more sharks around, but you also have days where you can sit up here and think you have no sharks around. You can be in the cage and watch one shark swim along on the bottom for about four or five hours, and you're like, whoa, well, there's no sharks here. But meanwhile, that shark, there's a whole battle going on down there, a dance, if you want to say, where he's asserting his dominance, he, him or she is asserting his dominance over the other sharks that are coming in, and he's chasing them all away. For decades, for, for generations, this has been a mindless, soulless, black-eyed, man-eating monster. And we're just beginning to understand that they dance, that they talk, that they communicate, and they have their own system. Yeah, it's just remarkable. It is amazing. And you're right at the front end of this. I don't know anybody mm -hmm. else who has spent this much time in this many places observing yeah. the Great White. I got to live my dream. I saw him as a kid. I saw Jaws, fell in love with him, and said, one day I'm going to see him out in the open. Did he just say he saw the movie Jaws and fell in love with sharks? It is a big jump from what you see on TV. Again, we talk about this mindless killing machine with the black eyes, and here you get to see them for themselves. They actually don't have black eyes. They have these beautiful <laughs> indigo blue eyes, and so you can feel them looking at you in the cage, and it's, it's amazing. Um, but yeah, to see them out here swimming, they're not these ferocious killing machines that they're made out to be. Again, it's just one of these unfortunate things that does happen from time to time, but we need to bear in mind that this is their home and it is our playground. For myself as a child of the 70s and 80s, I grew up with the enduring cultural legacy of the, of the Great White in particular as a mindless man-eating machine. And it's really exciting to be on this boat where you have all of these biologists and scientists that are truly in a celebratory mood um, talking about shark biology and how darn smart these creatures are. I mean, they really are. Yes, they are. I enjoy sharing the knowledge I've learned here at Guadalupe Island with people that come to see the great white shark. And it sends people home with a message that these are animals that need to be protected. And uh, they are uh, not mindless killers that uh, most uh, television programs would lead you to believe. They're uh, gentle giants that are part of our environment. Did you just call a great white shark a gentle shark? Yeah, they are. <laughs> like Barney? Yeah, I think they are. I mean, even Barney can have a bad day. <laughs> He's a diva. <laughs> you see him, see him take out some kids accidentally. Like, around. Gentle giants. And now we can get back into our protective cage. Do great white sharks actually want to eat us? I want you to meet the guy whose research is focused like a laser on exactly that. I wanted to ask you, Patrick, because you are doing the definitive first-time study right. on actual versus perceived risk here in the waters off Southern California. Right. What are you finding? Well, so the reason why we're doing this research is that, of course, there is that perception of risk. You mm -hmm. know, people think that if a shark is in the water, that it's gonna bite them. That's just a fact, it's dogma at this point. But there's little evidence for that. So we've actually teamed up with the lifeguards and uh, police pilots all across the coastline, filming the beaches for us, varying times of day, varying times of, you know, turbidity in the water, different wave heights, different tidal heights. Sharks are in the water all the time. They're around people all the time. And the stats just aren't there that they're going after you. Even when they are around you, we think that they're just cruising. You know, they're not, either not paying attention or actively avoiding you. So it is not a, Peter Benchley Jaws no, scenario. No, we don't think so. We do know that you are more likely to be struck by a falling vending machine, which you probably deserve because you're trying to get a free snack, than you are to be 
bitten to death by a great white shark. I remember as a boy doing laboratory experiments with my daddy. We set up an aquarium and tried to teach zebra dinos how to move to different parts of the aquarium for a stimulus response experiment involving food. Of course, we used the wrong laboratory techniques and it was very silly, but it was fun. And that, in turn, led me to think of the amazing scientist Eugenie Clark, one of the first to really study sharks. She determined that not only can sharks learn, but they're really good at it. Better than goldfish or any other bony fish you could imagine. Sharks learn at a capacity akin to mammals, like rats and mice. Those are the creatures we see running around labyrinths to perform nominally complex tasks. Sharks have actually learned to associate the sounds of a boat with people and with tuna. In fact, when tuna fishermen take a tuna, the sharks, apparently, according to all the locals, will actually wait until the fisherman has tired up the fish, brought him in, and the fish is right at the back of the boat, and then the shark grabs the tuna! This footage shows a tuna fisherman getting his catch eaten right before his eyes. Pretty smart shark, if you ask me. This is magnificent, mysterious, barren, volcanic Guadalupe Island. There are magazine pictures and descriptions, not that old, of this island as a lush, forested land. The Russians were the first here. They came with goats. They came to do some logging. The goats were an invasive species that completely cleared the landscape. Hunters came and they cleared all of this area of the fur seals, the pinnipeds, the elephant seals that were here until little by little, this otherworldly, lifeless landscape was born. It's just starting to turn around. But to give you some idea, in 1892, the last northern elephant seals in the world, eight of them, were right here. And the Smithsonian Institution, for some reason, promptly came and shot six of them for their collection. All of the remaining northern elephant seals in the world are descended in their DNA from the few survivors that were right here. This was long privately owned by American companies and by the United States of America until the Mexican government said, hey, this is our island, and they took it back. Now our countries are working very closely together with scientists and ecologists to start bringing back what was lost here at Guadalupe Island. This place is known for attracting uh, the larger great whites later in the year. How do we figure out the size? They don't wait for you to get your measuring tape out. So sometimes we have to guess. I estimate that particular great white to be, gee, I don't know, 14 feet? It's really hard to estimate the size of the great white. There's talk about the 21-footer that was measured off Cuba. There's talk about a 23-footer off Kangaroo Island in Australia, and another one off Malta. But it's very hard to be exact. The traditional method to measure the size of a fish is to take a stereoscopic picture of it. Two cameras, a precise distance away from each other, take a picture of the same fish at exactly the same time. Now hold on. It's more simple than it seems. When you develop the pictures, <laughs> you see how old I am. When you develop the picture, when, they, when you pour the developing fluid onto your laptop and develop the pictures, you'll see that, for instance, because you have two cameras a specific distance away from each other, the, for instance, eyes of the fish in the pictures will be a specific distance away from each other. This distance, no matter how far away the fish is from you, is directly related to the distance between the cameras. That's how stereo photography works to measure distance, and it's been the same routine for a hundred years. 
In the old days, stereo photography as a measurement tool was mostly used for aerial topography. We use the same ideas in the water. And our biologist friends are at the cutting edge of laser technology to figure out just how big these beasts can be. Dr. Mickey McComb Kobza at the Ocean First Institute is at the forefront of this technology. Two lasers, a known distance away from each other, are fired in perfect parallel. A camera records the results. The distance between the beams remains the same as the distance we can measure on the shark. Same idea, new technology. Using software, we take a measurement, helping us judge the size and weight of the shark. Cool. Sharks and laser beams, as good as it gets. I want to tell you about the seven senses. Yes, seven senses of the great white shark. First of all, sight. The great white shark engages in something called spy hopping. It's unique to him. He'll stick his head out of the water to look at you through the air to see if you might be a good lunch. Astonishing. No other fish, to my knowledge, knows this. Smell. You know, his nose is not connected to his breathing apparatus. It's just for smelling. And he's really good at it. He can smell a drop of blood in possibly a million or two million gallons of water. Taste. He has no tongue, which is probably a good thing because it might get really cut up. But he does have taste receptors in his mouth. And remember, this indiscriminate man-eater is actually a really picky eater. He bites and he spits. Hearing. He's very good at hearing and he loves low frequency sounds. Thump, thump, thump. Why? We're still looking at it. Touch. He's very, very sensitive and touch is an important part of love play in the rare mating process. In fact, it's never been seen in the wild. Now, six. These awesome lateral lines. They're filled, as are the ampullae of Lorenzini on his nose, with an ionized gelatinous mass. He is extremely electrosensitive, and the lateral lines, along with the ampullae of Lorenzini, ampullae of Lorenzini, can sense even the electric signature of a heartbeat trying to hide under a layer of sand. This guy is extremely sensitive, and we're just beginning to discover the magic of his seven senses. Not only do these creatures have an amazing sense of sight, smell, and of course their electroreception, which we've talked about a little bit, a lateral line that goes down their whole body that they use to feel electrical impulses as light as a heartbeat. The sensitivity of the great white shark in terms of electrical sensitivity is something like one millisiemen per meter, which is like, I don't know, a double-A battery in the salt water a mile away from you. We have trouble even detecting an electrical field as low as a billionth of a volt with our instruments. Research shows the shark has these tools built in. Some of the tools we're using to track sharks are giving us mind-boggling information about behavior we never thought was possible from the Great White. One of the things that really blew my mind was when you were telling me about the 20-some thousand kilometer voyage of Nicole. Nicole, yeah. Nicole was a shark we tagged uh, back in South Africa. She did something that nobody knew white sharks did, and which is these huge transoceanic journeys. We had theories about it, but of course nobody had an active track on one. So what they did was they tagged her off Dyer Island down in South Africa, um, closer to the beach side, and then all of a sudden she just went on this journey, and about 99 days later she showed off the northwest coast of uh, Western Australia. Six months later, she was resighted back in South Africa. Reminded of the time sailing across the Atlantic, there was no other sign of change other than the liquid crystal display of the sonar unit, the depth sounder, 420, 420, 450, 5, 6, 6, 650, and then nothing. We had gone off a shelf. 
And I realized at that moment, a chill goes through your spine and you realize that there's a whole undersea world. There are cliffs and seamounts and populations and migrations. Now you know that the Earth is a big magnet, right? A big dipole magnet. But it is also comprised of millions or billions of other dipole signatures, contour lines, and lines that run all over, that have a magnetic signature of their own. When we learned that the great white shark, for instance, in its oscillatory swimming patterns, can travel hundreds of meters below the surface and hundreds of meters above the bottom of the ocean, where he sees neither stars nor moon nor any patterns on the ground or sea mounts, and he can travel through currents in a straight line, currents that would otherwise deflect his path, just as an autopilot and a GPS would work together. We learn that not only does he have the compass, but he has the map somewhere ingrained in him to find his way through this entire universe about which we know almost nothing. One way to identify the male, as opposed to the female, is his two claspers. The males, as you know, they don't have penises, but they have these amazing two claspers that are utilized in the mating procedure. Great whites have never been observed mating, but we have observed other shark species doing so, like these nurse sharks. It's a rather violent affair. The male will nip her and then really grab her with his teeth and try to take her down as part of the mating process. It's really astonishing. Is this the way great white sharks mate? We're not sure. But we know there are often bite marks all over the pectoral fins of sexually mature female great whites. What do we know about their mating habits? So we don't know much, and a lot of scientists disagree. They want uh, everyone has their own opinion, but until we get more proof or more evidence of uh, actually seeing them mate underwater or seeing them give birth, uh, we really don't know. So why do male white sharks have two claspers? Because they're lucky. <laughs> And then, one, two, or maybe a few more pups hatch from eggs inside their mother, then spend almost a year gestating inside her before they're born. The word is ovoviviparous, but you could call it totally awesome. The baby sharks, the juvenile sharks, what are we learning and where are they going? In Santa California has become a very interesting place because mm. nowadays we can find um, an increase in presence of babies and juvenile white shark during the summer. Mm -hmm. And we have, my laboratory has started this incredible project to tag uh, baby white sharks in order to see their migration patterns and also their habitat use. What we have seen um, so far is that the baby white sharks, once the waters are start to cool down during the fall, they migrate along the coast towards Baja California. Babies and juveniles are moving? Babies and juveniles are moving towards Baja uh -huh. California. Sometimes in our society, we're obsessed with solid knowledge, definite yeses and nos. The problem is with the great white, there is so much we don't know. You know, that's the thing with white sharks is that nobody really knows why they do the things that they do. Just when you think you know something about a white shark, they go and do something completely different that changes everything you thought you knew about them up to that point. It's the best part about sharks because they're, they're so unpredictable and there's so much unknown about them that it just blows my mind. We I mean, don't even know why they're here, exactly. No idea. Mating, so the so. pinnipeds, maybe it's a hangout, maybe, who knows? This is what I love about these guys. These are the most passionate great white people on earth and they approach this subject with respect and curiosity and a childlike wonder and an open mind, an unegotistical attitude. This is not common in academia, but out here in the field, it's the only logical approach. Hey, you know what? I'm starting to understand how the animals in the zoo feel. Here come the mackerel jacks and the great whites looking at us in a cage. <laughs> 
You know, these cages were developed by the captain of this club. He wanted to find a way to make a shark cage, remarkably to me, that would not hurt the sharks. You'll see that it's rounded to protect the great whites. physical attributes take the great white to the top of the marine food chain over hundreds of millions of years. We got to get back to the shark lab. This is a juvenile. Yes, sir. Yes, cool. so this is pretty much a young of the year uh, juvenile white shark. As you can see, the teeth start out very pointy uh, young in life for them. So they're mostly targeting things like rays, stingrays, um, small fish, things squid, things like that. Um, and then as they get older, their teeth actually start to widen, more of like a broad triangular shape. Um, that's basically to help them as they start to target larger things like marine mammals. Um, it's not so much just to capture them, but to actually like saw and remove uh, larger chunks of like flesh, blubber, really ener energy rich things like that. And you can see these rows. His teeth are disposable. Yes, absolutely. So throughout life, uh, basically like a conveyor belt, these older teeth will wear out, fall out, and they're just constantly being replaced by this conveyor belt of new sharp pointy teeth. And this jaw is protrusive. It's not hard affixed to the skull or the cartilaginous skull of the great white. You can see it kind of move. How, yes. does, how does that work? Absolutely. So it's not directly attached to the skull. So it can basically, yeah, protrude and actually like kind of reach out a little bit and actually capture prey that way. He can control, he's controlling it with muscles, presumably. Yes. And mm -hmm. can, and what, but, but what is the reason for this morphology? What, why? I mean, it's just like, it turns the kill factor up to 11. Yeah, I mean, essentially, I think it would help it to open its mouth wider, and then it also can, you know, reach out just that little bit further, which can make the difference between catching or not capturing prey. For years, and I think even when I was a kid, they talked about 7,000 pounds per square inch bite strength. Mm -hmm. um, and now scientists, I think, are a little more open-minded, and they're saying, wait a minute, this is an extrapolation. We're never quite sure, and we realize that it is almost impossible to measure bite strength because he doesn't want to bite down on a gauge. Mm -hmm. But it's probably a nine or a 10 out of 10 <laughs> if, you, if you ask a, a yeah. seal. Don't want to be on the receiving end, for sure. <laughs> this is Pinniped Central. Fur seals, sea lions. This is what Guadalupe Island is all about. And what makes those things so cool is that they're fatty. They've adapted to have this huge blubbery layer so that they can exploit food sources at these higher latitudes. Anything north of here and in this cold water. And the Great White has exploited them by taking advantage of all of this fat 
Fat has about eight calories per gram of energy in it, and that's twice what's in muscle. And the sharks utilize and store all of this energy. That's why fatty things are their favorite foods, like whale blubber. But it's not just about energy consumption. It's about energy management, because as the shark goes to these higher latitudes, he uses what's called the rete mirabile, the miracle net of veins and arteries that operate like a kind of an interheater. Instead of losing the heat from his core ectothermically into the cold sea, he reabsorbs the heat from his core actively and into his most sensitive areas for hunting in order to endothermically take advantage of all of that heat energy that he gets from these fatty diets and other things that he eats. So when he takes this oscillating swimming path of changing the layers of the water, a little bit shallower, a little bit deeper as he moves, he will actively use this rete mirabile, this miracle net, to retain all of the heat that he gets up near the surface. That means when he does go deep again, because of this miracle net, the squid or whatever he wants to eat, do not know what hit them because it's this turbocharged thing with heat from the surface that is all of a sudden at their depths and about to have them for lunch. The miracle net means more squid. Or, as we used to say in the old country, rete mirabile significa calamari. Isn't it any wonder why everybody wants to get into marine biology? I mean, for instance, this morning we're at the breakfast table discussing the ampullae of Lorenzini, which are the electrosensitive elements of the shark's mouth. Now, most Americans have to hear things all day long like, oh, well, you know, I'm sorry, Larry, the cutbacks are a result of the corporate merger. I get to have breakfast with a bunch of marine scientists saying things like, ampullae of Lorenzini. I mean, come on, that's why everybody wants to get into marine biology. We're heading back offshore, and evidently we're going to hit some heavy stuff tonight. You know the guy who says, I never got seasick. <laughs> He's the guy who's going to be puking his guts out. Speaking of which, a great white shark really can puke his guts out. Through a phenomenon called eversion, the stomach actually leaves the mouth and comes back in. Spread out all the things he can eat, but does not digest, such as the lenses of the eyes of fish, like so many crystal poker chips. Eversion. Awesome. This super rare camera footage shows a living tiger shark everting his stomach and shaking side to side. It's totally cool. Some scientists think that in addition to cleansing his stomach, it could be a stress response, but we're not quite sure. Our approach so far is helping us understand the great white shark from a number of different angles morphology, behavior, ethology, but we can't forget that these populations are threatened worldwide. We're seeing the drop in numbers in South Africa as well. Nobody really knows, but South Africa was the first country to protect them in 1991. And the fact that we are maybe seeing a significant decline in our population is a worrisome idea. You know, we all talk about how rare the great white shark is, but we're just beginning to understand why he and she are so rare. First of all, the great white shark matures at a very late age. We thought for decades it was 10 or 15 years longer for the females, but new studies indicate it could be as much as 20 years. Second, when the shark does reach maturity and reproduce, those litters of shark pups are extremely small. Finally, the shark does not reproduce often. All of this stuff is fairly natural for a species with no natural predators until, of course, we come along. Now, as far as this is concerned, we know that the impact of overfishing will decimate a shark population. The great white population is kind of like this chain. Break one link, take one or two great white sharks out, and you have a drastic transgenerational effect on the whole. We do not know how close we are to the tipping point for the great white population, but we've got to learn as much as we can, as fast as we can. 
For instance, off the Farallon Islands in 1982, only four great white sharks, big ones, were destroyed. But the impact was felt on the populations of their prey animals for more than two years. The attacks on the pinnipeds after 82 was halved or more for more than two years. Now maybe you're thinking, that's great, fewer sharks, more cute seals, but wait, now with an unchecked seal population, they wipe out the fish populations. Not good. It's easy to see why the destruction of even a small number of great white sharks can have a drastic downward impact on the whole ecosystem for generations, for decades. Fortunately, in the past few years, 17 countries have agreed to protect the great white shark. So we're definitely seeing an improvement in um, the sustainability and um, possible uh, future of the great white shark. We mainly focus on conservation. You know, we want people to come out here uh, on any boat to see the sharks in their own natural environment and enjoy them. You know, they're not at the zoo. We're the ones in the cage. We're the ones at the zoo. They come to check us out. Since white sharks, they do not know about political boundaries, we know that they use a big range of movement. They migrate to different oceans. Because the white shark migrate uh, among different countries, we need a better international collaboration and a better policy enforcement in order to protect these species. When we work together, there's a ray of hope. It's very interesting to see how the population of baby white sharks has increased over the last decade in Southern California. We, we think that that might be uh, because of the ban of white shark fisheries in 1997 in the U.S. So now that the populations are increasing and all of this seems to have really worked, there aren't many happy stories, <laughs> but this is one of them, and it's your story. What next? 16 years ago we were seeing, you know, two sharks a trip was incredible. We'd be like, whoa, yeah, high five, you know. And, but it's great to see that more and more sharks are showing up every every year. We get new sharks, new sharks, new sharks. Uh, so it's an incredible thing. And, you know, through conservation efforts, we see more and more sharks every single year. Uh, I think it's a good collaboration between Mexico, the United States, the sharks, everybody kind of working together for the benefit of the entire ecosystem here at Guadalupe. And I think it's really made a change. So in the last decade, we've seen an increase in abundance of the great white sharks in the northeast eastern Pacific. With the increasing abundance of sharks, there is a potential for increased encounters with human uh, populations. So one of the key questions that uh, we are facing now is, how can we protect humans from increased encounter risk with predator sharks, but also how can we make sure that uh, we don't uh, disturb them from recovering to original population sizes. You know, numbers don't lie. You have 400 species of sharks worldwide. Take last year as an example. Out of billions of people that went swimming into the sea, how many fatal shark attacks happened? Five. <laughs> Counting billions of people and 400 species of sharks. And out of those five, how many of them were from a great white shark? In the world. In the world. A lot of people would come here thinking that they're going to see Jaws face their fear, that monstrous death-eating machine. <laughs> and then they come here and they're so like, what? But they're so majestic, they're so beautiful, peaceful. And it's completely the opposite of what people expect. Ecotourism is the way forward and um, again it needs to happen now before it's too late so that the future generations can also enjoy this. You know it started off it was my bucket list trip it's what I always wanted to do and now I've been fortunate I get to offer the people that same experience I get to bring them out here and they get to share in this and understand why we need to protect what is in our oceans before it's too late but most importantly it's all about changing perceptions. The media they love sharks. Sharks make good headlines they make good stories but unfortunately it's not reported the right way. Way. It's always sensationalized, whereas truth of the matter, what we're doing to the ocean and the planet, uh, depleting natural food stocks and everything, there is a big threat and we need to face it. And the only way to do that is by bringing people out here and facing that fear, um, introducing the animals so they can see what it really is and why they deserve the protection that they need. And there is no easy way to solve the problem. Shark nets are terrible. They kill more life than they save. They're indiscriminate. Whales, turtles, dolphins, sharks, everything is being killed in these things. You kill a shark with the idea that I'm protecting others. I'm saving so many other ones. It's so wrong because they're crucial to our ecosystem. They're always going to be blamed because that's what we as humans want to do. We're like, they're terrible. 
We need to kill them all. Let's not kid ourselves. They're wild animals. They're predators. So yeah, fear them. But the concept here, fear them with respect, with admiration. And this is what conservation is all about. It's protecting the species. A true appreciation and respect for the ocean is the only way forward. Seeing a shark in the ocean is a scary thing that I could completely relate to. But I guarantee you, an ocean without sharks, now that's much scarier. An ocean without sharks? That, that is a scary thing. Sadly, you know, a lot of people don't care. But there's a huge panoply of life in the ocean. We've learned these ecosystems are fragile from the bottom up and from the top down. These blue whales outside San Diego give evidence of a natural heritage that is part of our lives. From the largest creatures on Earth to the largest predatory fish, their importance is clearer than ever. What do we have? Questions, science, passions, perspectives, real biological mysteries that are so exciting. And these are the animals. And these are the people. It's just really exciting to be a small part of something so new and so big. This is a big change, a shift in understanding, a shift in attitude. This is the great white shift.